Good afternoon. I'd first like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this really uh, very interesting meeting. Um, I've been working on a project <coughs> called Kinetics for Drug Discovery that was a joint uh, initiative of the European pharmaceutical industry and academia, um, supported by the European Union, uh, with the aim, as written here, of enabling the adoption of uh, drug uh, target binding kinetic analysis in the drug discovery uh, decision making process. And um, this uh, was a collaboration between experimental and computational scientists. One of the goals was to come up with procedures for systematically measuring. Um, binding kinetics, and we focused on targets and kinase targets and GPCRs and a few others as examples of drug targets. Uh, the data generated during the project has been put into a database and will, as things get published, go into Campbell and be made available to everyone. Uh, another aim was to understand uh, the determinants of drug binding kinetics both in vivo and in vitro. Um, and in particular, to be able to come up with models, SKRs, structure kinetics, relationships, and computational tools. Um, so this is sort of so more uh, pictorially here. We have a really wide range of experimental techniques, a wide range of computational techniques were considered, and we tried really to come up with SKRs. And I think from the industry perspective, people were really hoping that one could come up with some simple rules uh, to allow one to design compounds uh, with the desired uh, kinetic properties, in particular binding kinetic properties. Um, of course, binding kinetics is actually quite complicated, and so I think we've learned a lot about the determinants of kinetics. We've learned a lot about the ways to measure kinetics and to try and compute them, but there's much also to be done. And so what I want to show you today is basically three uh, short, short topics. Um, two about what we've learned about determinants of drug binding kinetics from this combined experimental and computational work. One that's, let's say, gives us a sort of easy message and one that gives us a more complicated one. And then I want to talk about a method that we've developed called tau Ramdi um, for random acceleration molecular dynamics for computing uh, drug protein residence times. So let's go into the first example I want to talk about. This was uh, focused on a kinase, Haspin uh, kinase, and um, was a protein that had been worked on in uh, Stefan Knapp's laboratory in Frankfurt, where they solved structures with inhibitor, uh, of inhibitor complexes uh, and did uh, thermodynamic and kinetic measurements. And uh, the interesting thing here is if we look at the inhibitor here, compared to adenosine, it just has an, an additional halogen atom here. You can see the superposition of the two compounds in the binding site. And what's introduced here is a halogen interaction with a, a gatekeeper, an aromatic gatekeeper, a phenylalanine. And in this study, we looked at a number of different compounds varying in the halogen substituent in this position and uh, varying also in the residue at this gatekeeper position. And what this showed is that um, this halogen pi bonding type of interaction was important for giving tight binding and also for giving us a slow off rate. And as we increased the size of the halogen, we got slower dissociation Mutating away the aromatic immediately led to fast binding kinetics. We wanted to understand this computationally, um, so we did some quantum mechanical calculations of the interaction between the ligand and the aromatic um, residue. And you can see here plotted against the experimental off rates of the interaction energy computed, which shows a good agreement apart from an outlier for this threonine mutant without the aromatic interaction. And we can see that this is largely due uh, to the uh, correlation energy uh, interaction. Of course, with the quantum mechanical model, we could only just look at a small bit of the binding site. And so we also did MMGBSA calculations to compute the binding free energy, considering the whole protein. And here it was very important that we used the 
halogen extra point model to capture the uh, sigma hole effect uh, and therefore could get a reasonable correlation here with binding free energy or with the components of, this, of the terms computed with the binding enthalpy. And so this uh, study gave us in principle a fairly simple rule. If you want to increase resonance time, think about adding in halogen uh, pi interactions. Um, it also showed us from the quantum mechanic, uh, from the computational perspective, the issues that we can have, of course, with dealing with, uh, you trying to deal with these sorts of interactions with classical force fields. Now let's go to a system where we have a bit more complicated determinants of the binary kinetics, uh, in this case related to the protein conformational dynamics. So I'm going to talk here about heat shock protein 90, the N-terminal domain. Those of you who were here two days ago already had an introduction to this system. Uh, this uh, particular domain has been the uh, target of much design of anti-cancer compounds, and so we have a huge amount of information about various types of inhibitors that bind in this ATP binding site. But what's interesting for our purposes today is that this binding site has on one side a, an alpha helix, but it's not always an alpha helix. And if you look at different crystal structures, you can see this region sometimes is so-called loop out, sometimes loop in, and sometimes helical. And when, this, uh, when we have this change in the backbone structure, we also get a change in the shape of the binding pocket, and also then, of course, the ligands that can bind. So we have here an introduction of a sort of sub-pocket or a transient pocket. So we looked at a set of 20 resourcenal class uh, compounds and this was work that was done uh, together with scientists at MAC at Darmstadt and um, at uh, Zanofi. And what we found here for this set of 20 compounds, uh, varying uh, basically in two, two sites here, um, was that some of them, a subset, bound to the protein and showed a loop-in conformation here, and others bound to the helical conformation, in particular occupying this sub-pocket. If you look at the uh, thermodynamics, you can see that the ones binding to this helical conformation, the so-called helix binders, are entropically driven. So this is interesting because this is high affinity sub-nanomolar binding that is entropically driven. The loop binders, on the other hand, are entropically driven. When we come to the kinetics, um, you can see that the, pro, uh, the compounds binding to the helical conformation had slower on rates, lower on rates, and slower off. So they have slow kinetics compared to the ones binding to the loop conformation. So can we try and understand this difference here? Well, for that, we'd like to be able to simulate the dynamics of this system. And um, uh, what we first did was just to run standard molecular dynamic simulations. And if you, say, start with the uh, helical conformation here, it'll pretty much happily stay in that helical conformation. If you start in a loop conformation, it'll stay in a loop conformation. So in standard simulations, we've done this is 500 nanoseconds, we've done uh, more than microseconds, nothing much happens. So now comes a bit related to Markov state models. So we thought, well, what else can we do? We can try and do some enhanced sampling. So Mark Pianciotti is somewhere in the audience trying to do metadynamics for this. It proved very difficult to find a, collective, a set of collective variables that allowed us to sample this transition. So we also tried to do some adaptive sampling, so running many 100 nanosecond simulations and then restarting from positions that would allow us perhaps to sample the transition between these different conformations. But so far, we haven't been able to sample adequately in order to be able to begin even really properly to build a Markov state model. Um, <clears throat> so the problem is really that we have um, a, um, a very slow transition between these different states. On the other hand, we applied our LRIP, Langevin Rotationally Induced Perturbation Approach, um, to Oh, sorry, um, to, um, to uh, sample this dynamic. So this is a method based on the rotationally induced perturbation method developed by Dave Eggard that we adapted in order to try and find transient pockets in, in uh, proteins. And the idea is that you uh, 
uh, go around the residues around the binding site, and for each residue, you put the kinetic energy into one dihedral, side chain dihedral angle, and then you let the system sort of go in a very short implicit solvent simulation and then relax further with explicit solvent. And in this way, you can sample the dynamics around the binding site. And what you'll notice if you, uh, if we, I'm just showing the sampling now for two different residues, that you can see we're perturbing this uh, helical region here and sampling these uh, different loop conformations that you see in the different crystal structures. And this is all done in a few uh, nanoseconds of simulation. So it allows us really very quickly uh, to probe the distortions of a binding site. Um, and, I, and as I said, we've aimed at doing this to identify uh, changes in pocket conformation that are relevant for ligand binding. Now, based on this and looking at the residues that had the biggest effect on the helix structure, we noticed that the primary one was this leucine 107. And so we thought, well, what happens if we mutate this residue to an alanine? Um, we would expect that perhaps to stabilize the helix. And in simulations that we did, uh, starting from the helix conformation or starting from the loop conformation, you can see that in the mutant, uh, the helical form is stabilized with respect to the wild type. What happens experimentally? Well, Marta Amaral at uh, NAC solved the crystal structure of the mutant, and you can see the mutant structure overlapped on the wild type. It looks exactly the same. So that didn't really tell us much. Um, then we have some data from FTIR from Jörn Gutenhoep in, in Bochum, and he actually saw in his studies in solution that there's more helical structure in the mutant. And we're in the process now of also doing NMR studies on this system, which show us actually that uh, the um, protein in the APO form is rather flexible and that this is not uh, the main conformation that you have uh, um, of the protein. So if the mutant is more stable than the wild type, what effect does that have on binding to compounds that will change the relative stability of the, our complexes? And we could see that, again, by running simulations with uh, compounds where we have the sort of loop uh, type model or the uh, conformation or the helical conformation. And you can see, in general, that the mutation uh, would stabilize the helical uh, form. And what's going on if it does that? Because when we take the leucine side chain away, we are taking some of the interactions with the ligand away. Um, but what the protein actually does, as you can see from the crystal structure here with the mutant, is to slightly adjust the position of the helix so that the uh, adjacent asparagine can make the interactions with the ligand and we can maintain uh, this sort of sub-pocket that we have underneath the helix. So now let's go back to the thermodynamics and kinetics here. We have the wild type I showed you before. Here's the mutant. We can see that, that uh, on mutation, the um, uh, entropically favored binding to the helical conformation becomes less, less entropically favored. Right? We shift more in this direction towards enthalpic binding. Moreover, the on rates, uh, as you can see here, have shifted such that the on rates on average are indistinguishable between are the two conformations here, although the difference in the off rates is maintained. So this has now become, let's say, probably, I would say the mutant will become more of a conventional protein target. Can we understand that better? Well, we can see if we look at B factors in the crystal structures of the protein um, um, that if you can compare the loops conformation with the helical one, red indicates higher mobility, we've got more mobility in the helical form, hinting that the helix dynamics is important for this entropically driven binding. Um, computationally, what we tried to do is to compute basically all the entropy terms that we could do, and that's what I'm trying to show over here. So we're looking now to compare wild type and mutant and the differences between the helix binders and the loop binders, the experimental data is here. And here's our overall computed entropic contribution, and we've done, computed different contributions. Initially, we thought, well, maybe we'll solvent is important, but if you compute ligand desolvation or protein desolvation, you cannot distinguish between these uh, two, the mutant and the wild type, or also for the binding entropy. And the only place we see the difference is in the entropy considering 
the uh, two helices and this loop helix transition. And we estimated that by two techniques. One was using a quasi-harmonic PCA type of approach to give us a sort of upper estimate on the entropy contribution. And the other one was using this correlation corrected multibody local approximation for torsions, which would give us a lower estimate. So we're sort of between these two values, and you can see that's a huge range in entropy. Um, but um, at least it is consistent with the experimental data, gives us some sort of ballpark estimate of the entropic contribution, and indicates how um, the uh, helix dynamics may have an effect upon the binding. So schematically, what we can see here is for the set of compounds that we looked at here, um, the helix binders um, uh, have, uh, uh, have their um, uh, uh, long residence times due to stabilizing the ground state and affecting the transition state, whereas binding to the mutant, more the effect between the different compounds is in affecting the uh, differences in binding to the ground state. I should note that in this case, the long residence times are important also at the cellular level. Um, the sustained inhibitory effect leads to an intracellular upregulation of HSP70 monitored. Um, and so we see here that the conformational flexibility of the protein in the bound state can contribute to the entropically driven high binding affinity and long residence times, uh, suggesting actually that it would be advantageous to think about targeting protein targets where you've got that bit of flexibility that you can maintain in the bound state. So that was what we sort of learned from trying to uh, understand the structure kinetic relationships for this particular class of, pro of compounds uh, binding to a HSP90. Um, now, if you think about uh, schematically, very simply, about the process of a ligand binding to a protein and trying to look at the kinetics, from a computational perspective, what I've shown you so far has just been studying this bound state. But really, we need to consider this transition state as well in computations. And obviously, that's difficult because our force fields are generally trained on the bound states and not what's up here. And of course, there can be ligand parameter issues like I showed before for halogens. And moreover, sampling is probably going to be trickier here uh, than here for greater flexibility, considering greater flexibility. Um, so, going back to this beginning of this project, I mentioned the K4DD project. We wrote a review at the beginning, which we thought we'd write about drug binding kinetics, and really there was hardly anything in the literature about computations of drug binding kinetics. There was lots of kinetics, but not on drug-like molecules. And more recently, we've written another review uh, down here, and of course, in this time, there's just been a huge flurry of activity with lots of people producing all sorts of different techniques to compute drug binding kinetics. And we tried to put them together in this uh, paper. So we've got a range of techniques for calculating dissociation rates, another range for association rates, and for pathway sampling. And these range from techniques that just need a, a few nanoseconds of simulation right up to very computationally expensive uh, procedures. Uh, many of these have uh, uh, been developed also by people in, in, the, in the audience uh, here. And most often they're tested on one or a few cases, sometimes sort of as it were, simple cases like um, benzamidine trypsin binding. But what has been lacking, of course, is access to large data sets to really develop and test the methods. And this is what we've tried to address as a need in this uh, K4DD project. Um, so do, in, we have been developing a few techniques, and I'm only going to tell you today about one of them. But just to mention, we're working on combining Brownian and molecular dynamics to compute on rates. We're working on sort of more machine learning or QSKR approaches to estimate relative on rates and off rates based on some work we did years ago um, to develop com combined analysis or comparative binding energy analysis for binding affinities. We find this works actually remarkably well for off rates. Um, and also we've been working on this method that I'm going to discuss today, uh, Tau Ramdi, uh, which is an enhanced sampling procedure where we try to accelerate the rate of uh, ligand unbinding in order to give us relative residence times. 
So it's similar a bit in spirit to some of the scale of molecular dynamics you probably heard about uh, this meeting, or targeted or steered molecular dynamics, but the procedure is different. And the aim is to have a really, right, computationally rather uh, quick or cheap method that you can apply quite easily, perhaps doing something like lead optimization. So I want to tell you about that for the remainder of my time. <coughs> so it's based on the random acceleration or random expulsion molecular dynamics method that we developed really quite some years ago with the aim of um, trying to understand how uh, small molecules can get out of buried binding sites in proteins. The technique is extremely simple. We do a standard molecular dynamic simulation with the one addition that we add a force to the center of mass of our ligand in a random orientation. And then we run the simulation for a certain number of steps, and then we look and see whether the ligand moved or didn't. If it moves, we just keep going. And if it didn't, we choose randomly a new orientation for our force and keep going. And this allows us to get the ligand out of the binding site in time scales of about a nanosecond, and to do that uh, in a way that we just sort of gently, as it were, probe to find our way out of the binding site. We sort of minimum perturbation of everything else so that we can really just focus on accelerating the ligand exit. So, um, now this gives you um, this an example of three trajectories that we have simulated for a ligand going out of uh, HSP 90. Um, so you get some idea of the motions. You can see we've got one going out here. Um, you'll see these take a bit longer to go out. And the idea is that the length of time that we need to get the ligand out during the RAMD simulation should be related to the actual real residence time, even though we've accelerated the time scale a lot. Um, and so if we can correctly predict relative residence times, then we're going to be able to extract information also about the key features of the transition barrier to egress and of the unbinding and be able to understand uh, the um, unbinding process and therefore the determinants of residence time. So you'll see here, this one goes out here, and this one, after having to twist around for some time, ends up going out over here. Um, so you can see that the method is unbiased. You don't say where it's going to go out before it goes out. Now, in order to use RAMD for um, computing residence times, we've come up with this protocol, which we call TAU, TAU for residence time, TAU RAMD. Um, which um, is a procedure that allows you to set up the parameters, equilibrate the system, importantly, sample well over the bound states, and then taking snapshots from your equilibration MD molecular dynamics and go into the random acceleration molecular dynamics, do uh, multiple uh, trajectories of these, ensure you've done enough uh, sampling if necessary to go back with certain criteria for that, and then after you've, uh, from the simulations, you basically look at when the ligand goes out and can compute from a set of trajectories an effective uh, residence time. And you can analyze the statistics to make sure you have sampled sufficiently well in order to get a reasonably reliable quantity. Um, uh, this whole procedure is uh, set up now as a fully sort of, uh, uh, sort of full workflow. And there's basically only one adjustable parameter, which is the force magnitude, which is constant throughout the simulations for our additional random force. Um, we found that this value works well for a wide range of uh, drug target systems, but sometimes you need to adjust it a little bit. We've tested the adjustment, and the procedure's fairly robust to that. Um, but it really depends, of course, whether you're looking at very fast or very slow um, binding kinetics. Overall, we need about... 80 to 200 nanoseconds per uh, compound for this. Um, and as I said, no priori knowledge of dissociation pathway. Um, so we've been working on a number of different systems. It's just to show I will talk about the HSP90 application, but we're also working on different kinases, type 1 and type 2 inhibitors, and GPCRs. And you can see we get correlation, as illustrated here, um, between computation and experimental residence times. So I'll just show you about the, the HSP90 case here. We were lucky enough to have a large data set with 70 complexes consisting of helix binders and loop binders. Uh, they are very diverse inhibitors. They occupy both the ATP binding site and the, this hydrophobic pocket under the helix and another solvent pocket and have a quite right, wide range of kinetic parameters. <coughs> 
Uh, this just to show they have 11 different scaffolds with different interactions with solvent in the binding site as well. So this is the result we get for this data set. Here's the computed resonance time versus the experimental one. You can see that most of the compounds lie on this uh, line here with about a factor of twofold uh, in, the, uh, uh, agree in the range for agreement between experiment and, and computed values. Um, this is not dependent on whether we have crystal structures or not. Uh, the reliability here is dependent on how many trajectories you do. So as you increase the number of trajectories, uh, you reduce the uh, standard deviation in your computed uh, residence time. Um, in some systems, you are dependent, uh, you have dependence, and others less dependence on the initial snapshot that you start the RAMD trajectories from. That depends very much on the uh, system. <coughs> we have looked at why do we have these outliers. You can see one lot is all in green, so this is one particular class. Within that class is actually quite a good ranking, um, but clearly they're on a different line from the others. We think this is a force field issue, but we're not sure why. Um, some of them are related to stabilization of the initial bound states. So if I take that particular outlier, um, that's this compound here. And one can see just after the equilibration stage, after 20 nanoseconds of equilibration, compared to the crystal structure confirmation, there's some change here. And this change is enough to destabilize the system such that in the RAMD calculations, we have an underestimate of the residence time. So again, we think you know, this is something where we maybe should experiment with different force fields. Um, but it's not directly related to the RAMD procedure. Here's another example where you can get um, a range of resonance times computed. Here we've taken, I show two uh, structures at the end of independent molecular dynamic simulations, equilibration simulations, before we start the RAMD calculations. And you can see they just differ in a side chain, this phenylalanine, that's how it is in the crystal structure. In this case, it's sort of come inwards. Uh, oh, sorry, so come outwards, excuse me, uh, become soft and exposed, and the ligand has gone into where that phenylalanine ring was. And when the ligand then needs to go out of the binding site, the phenylalanine gets in the way and is a hindrance and leads to much longer computed times. So we have, in this case, for different trajectories starting from this or this structure, shorter or longer residence times. So this is a general sort of sampling issue we have to deal with with looking at kinetics. Um, I should just point out that in, within congeneric series, we can compute the trends uh, correctly, and that's in both in cases where you uh, do and do not have a relationship with, between the off rate and the binding affinity. And we can also get some mechanistic information here. I'm just showing this, for example, for three different structures uh, where we have uh, different range of residence times, also different on and off rates. And we can see that for the slowest unbinding compound, um, we have more variation in the protein structure upon unbinding, and that's because, as shown in this diagram here, we have more than one root out. This is the compound I showed you the movies of before, whereas for the other compounds that go off more quickly, we just have exit via this root here. So we can get different uh, me uh, mechanisms of exit, and this is related here to the need or not for the, pro for the ligand to distort. And in this case, we picked up uh, charge interactions that were important for the residence time. Um, so just to sum up, I want to just say that I think the, the RAMD procedure allows one to have very, with a very computationally efficient a procedure um, to uh, explore the egress pathways and to compute relative residence times. Of course, these are also relevant for understanding actually binding free energies because we're sampling both the ground state and the transition state to, uh, to unbinding. Um, and we can give some, get some information about dissociation mechanisms. Finally, I just want to, introduce, uh, to draw your attention to this website we set up called KB Box as a sort of toolbox for computational methods for studying kinetics of molecular binding. So this is designed as a sort of place, particularly where new users can go and find out about different sorts of approaches and when they might be able to use them according to what data they have available or what they, what they want to uh, find out. Um, and gradually, as we publish the work um, from my lab, but also from other laboratories um, out of K4DD, uh, we will put tutorials and worked examples on this uh, website. And I would also encourage you to uh, contribute uh, to this website uh, with uh, your different methodologies that you have for computing kinetics. 
It's just a sort of site where you can find out about these things. You can actually do the comp you cannot do the computations there at this point. Okay, and finally, I'd just like to thank all my uh, collaborators, in particular Daria Koch, a senior postdoc in the group who has done the work on HSP90 calculations and on the Tau Ramdi method, and Gaurav Ganotra, a, uh, a doctoral student who did the work on the Haspian kinase, and uh, all of these other people for their uh, various uh, contributions to the work. Thank you for your attention. Question. There you go. So, yeah, I think this is really, really phenomenal work and uh, is really comprehensive. So, um, uh, the question we're really interested in is looking at kind of the robustness of the ligand binding transition state. Once you start looking at different ligands, how many or what types of features are conserved uh, in the ligand binding transition state? So, you showed some different pathways, and you would expect that those would be, let's say, different. Um, in terms of the molecular features. But uh, in general, looking over the set of 70 ligands, can you speak to uh, which, if any, of the features of the transition state are conserved? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And we've been trying to analyze the trajectories and dig out information and also do simple regression analyses and see if we can come up with simple determinants. And we cannot say there's just one factor that's important. Um, so even, even if you have the same route out, you have different factors determining the transition and so on. So we've looked at you know, what sort of contacts are more contacts that you don't have, for example, in the bound state, but you do have in the transition state before you go out. Um, these, you, you do pick up features there, but you cannot say that they're always present. Right? So I think you've really got a, a number of a different features contributing. Um, and this is something we are now playing with machine learning techniques to try and see if we can dig out. Um, because, I mean, if, if you just have simple things like halogen pi interactions, of course, you can focus in on that. And we have a few, few simple factors, certain ligands, where you really have to change a certain dihedral angle, for example. Um, but in many cases, there are alternatives, right? There are alternative uh, interactions that a ligand can make in going out of one route, for example. And those together contribute to the transition barrier for, for the ligand exit.